On this episode of In the Life, the marriage wars reach a fevered pitch in California. What's at stake is what kind of country are we going to live in? NAACP chairman Julian Bond on why he supports full equality for LGBT citizens. The right to be married is a civil right, and I believe civil rights ought to be extended to everybody. And one very special wedding. An extraordinary day. All this and more on In the Life, documenting the people and issues shaping the gay experience. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Amering and Foundation. New Paul Foundation, Arcus Foundation, the estate of Richard W. Wyland, David Beitzel and Darren Walker, Agnes Gunn and Daniel Shapiro, and these funders, and by the annual support of In the Life members like you. I need both of you to raise your right hands. And do you solemnly swear that the information provided on this license is true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. On February 12, 2004, Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon became the first same-sex couple to be issued a marriage license in the state of California. I pronounce you spouses for life. Set in motion by San Francisco Mayor Gavin Newsom, the mass marriage event that followed captured the world's attention. Six months later, however, the marriage of Dell and Phyllis, as well as 4,000 others, were made null and void. But four years later, Dell and Phyllis once again exchanged vows, this time in front of the mayor himself and with the legal blessing of the California Supreme Court. Tonight on In the Life, an in-depth look at our most populous state's journey to marriage equality and the real possibility that it could all once again be stripped away. I'm Michael Billy, and you are watching In the Life, now in a new half-hour format. During our 17 years on national public television, we have returned often to the difficult struggles states have had with the controversial subject of marriage for same-sex couples. In Hawaii, in Vermont with civil unions, and in Massachusetts, where in 2004, same-sex couples for the first time received full marriage equality in a state. We lead once again with marriage this time in California, because on May 15, 2008, the Supreme Court of that state ruled four to three that the state constitution protects a fundamental right to marry that extends to same-sex couples. The storm that followed that historic ruling has all culminated in a proposition and a vote that could very well decide the future of the gay rights movement in this country. What a day in San Francisco! What a day for America! What a day for equality! It's, just, it's so fabulous. It's so great. It's so great. <laughs> The decision today, it just expresses uh, our deepest held values of human being. It is a wonderful day to be in this movement and to be alive and to be here to see this happen. We're going to get married. We're going to get married. The best day of my life was when Diane and I met, and so this is the second best day of my life. The ruling by the California Supreme Court is one of the, if not the most significant, ruling from any court on LGBT rights in the history of this country. What the court seemed most moved by was the understanding of what marriage means. The word, the ceremony, the opportunity to say, I'm married, I'm getting married. When people ask us, well, why aren't civil unions enough? I really think of my parents and think, well, what if I had grown up thinking, my parents aren't able to marry, but they got an interracial union. While the neighbor's parents, they're married because they're of the same race. The court understood that for lesbian and gay people to be excluded from that meant that we were denied a whole way of interacting with our families and our community. Kate Kendall heads up the National Center for Lesbian Rights, 
which served as lead counsel on behalf of same-sex couples in the marriage equality case. It is about love. It is about dignity. It is about our children and the fundamental principles of the most basic human values of opportunity and fairness extend to every one of us. While the scene on the ground in California was pitched high that day last May, people from across the country were watching and waiting at their computers for the historic decision to come down. Evan Wolfson heads the organization Freedom to Marry, and we were with Evan the moment he got the news from California. Six, huh? Yes? No. We won and we won now. That's, that's just fantastic. He has been working to win marriage equality for same-sex couples for 25 years. Now, now the fight begins. Oh, my God. But we won. The opinion was written by a Republican-appointed chief justice who's considered to be very cautious, very conservative, and very respected. Not only upheld the freedom to marry, but because it even went further. It talked about how wrong discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation is. One month later, June weddings took on a whole new meaning on the West Coast. Now in California, separate and unequal is a thing of the past. And I'm really happy to see this day come. We are gathered here in the presence of witnesses for the purpose of uniting in matrimony. We want to be able to say, here, we were there on that day. And you know we love each other, and, and now people have to respect that. I pronounce you married. You may kiss. Congratulations. Here we are at a time when our economy is in trouble. All the people who are planning weddings and all the expenses tied to weddings, that's going to help small businesses all throughout this state, and it's going to help the state coffers. I definitely feel like I'm in the history of making the first uh, weddings. And I'm a small business, but all of a sudden I'm becoming a lot larger than I thought I would. We think the implications for the economy in California are going to be huge. And we don't just don't think it. The governor thinks it. The mayor of Los Angeles thinks it. Marriage is also a promise made in the hearts of two people. California Supreme Court has spoken. And what is more fundamental than the right to marriage? It's about human dignity. It's about civil rights. It's about time. By the way, as California goes, so goes the rest of the nation. It's important because it's California, because that immediately brings us to over 15% of the United States. The ramifications around the country will be unlike anything else. This is ground zero for our movement for the next five months. While the Massachusetts Supreme Court decision in 2004 alarmed the conservative right, the ruling in California set the stage for a battle of epic proportions. This November, Californians will vote on Proposition 8, which would amend the state constitution to prohibit marriage for same-sex couples. Proposition 8 would reverse the California Supreme Court decision. Same-sex marriage redefines this fundamental social good. And it, and it changes the public meaning of marriage. And it puts into the law the idea that those of us who understand that there's something unique and special about a mother and a father, a husband and a wife, are bigots. The objection we have is, is you know, it's not right to change the foundation of society, restructure marriage just to conform to the lifestyles of a, of a small group of people. Their goal is to change the state constitution to say that the only marriages that will be valid and recognized in California are marriages between one man and one woman. One thing both sides know is that victory may well be decided by the amount of money raised to deliver their message. It's obvious we need to raise a lot of money because in the media, in California media market, it costs a lot of money to get your message out. If my dad married a man, who would be my mom? I'm confused. Marriage means a mom and a dad. Our opponents are saying they're going to raise uh, $15 million or more uh, to, to basically spread misinformation about 
the uh, California Marriage Amendment. California is a huge state, 30 million people, 18 million registered voters. That is a huge audience of people that we need to move and come to understand why they should vote no on this amendment. And the money has been flowing. Conservative groups spent an estimated $2 million just to gather the signatures needed to get Proposition 8 on the ballot in November. Whatever it takes, they'll spend. They have groups like Focus on the Family that have enormous budgets who could pour tons of money into California. We cannot afford to let right-wing extremist forces out money raises. Both sides have raised considerable sums for their campaigns, fueled by individual donors, nonprofit organizations, and labor and corporate groups, with experts predicting the combined total could reach $30 million. Ultimately, the fate of Proposition 8 lies squarely in the hands of non-gay voters. One of them, Dale Kelly Bankhead, is working hard on the ground with the LGBT community to defeat Proposition 8. If every LGBT person in California voted no on this initiative, that wouldn't be enough people. And so the community has to reach out to its natural allies, and those natural allies are other groups who believe in fairness and equality and fundamental freedoms. And so we've put together this amazing coalition of well over 100 organizations, labor, faith-based organizations, women's groups. Brian Brown sees potential support for Proposition 8 in communities with traditionally strong family ties. We've been invited on Spanish radio, Spanish television, and our message has been received very well. Unfortunately, there are too many people uh, who want to turn back the hands of time, uh, divide us on issues uh, that, frankly, uh, we need to get beyond. What I think is that, ultimately, the voters of California are going to think back over the summer to all the couples they've seen getting married and making those commitments, and they're going to say, I don't want to take that away. That would be unfair. They deserve the same freedom that I have. We have to be focused on our one chance to give the voters the chance to say, we know what marriage is, we want to protect it, and that's in November. People understand there's something wrong about four judges trumping uh, 4.5 million California voters. The California Supreme Court was the first court in the country to strike down race restrictions on who could marry whom, and it did so in 1948, this year being the 60th anniversary. And taking that profound legacy from 1948, here in 2008, the very same court took our country forward, and as in 1948, history will vindicate it. I think again of the example of my parents. When they were able to marry almost 60 years ago, polls showed that if interracial marriages had been put up for a vote in California, my family would have been voted out of existence. Now time. Congratulations. Hi, wife. What's at stake is what kind of country are we going to live in? That is the nature of what we are facing in November. And if we were to beat this amendment, and continue to have couples being married in California, we could really hit that tipping point and turn the corner where lesbian and gay people finally, no matter where you live, enjoy a measure of protection and security. We will continue to follow the marriage debate closely as it unfolds in states across the country. And, later this season, an interview with Randy Weingarten of the American Federation of Teachers, The Trevor Project, a lifeline for LGBT youth at risk, and an exclusive interview with New York State Governor David Patterson. I'd like to believe that Dr. King, uh, as soon as he became aware, would have spoken for gay and lesbian citizens in this country. And now, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and Washington Post editorial writer Jonathan Capehart sits down with NAACP chairman Julian Bond to discuss the intersection of gay rights and civil rights, marriage equality for all, and a friendship with a gay man who was the architect of the 1963 March on Washington. You've been chairman of the NAACP since 1998, correct? Right. How has the organization changed or evolved since the civil rights movement? Well, it has um, changed focus in a slight way. 
because we've always had the same focus, which is fighting racial discrimination. We've done that since 1909, and I, I'm sorry to say we'll probably be doing it for some time in the future. Let's talk about the time back during the, the Civil Rights Movement. You've said that there were many gays and lesbians involved in the movement, of course, and you credited them with shaping your views on gay rights. Did you know Bayard Rustin? Yes. Talk about Bayard Rustin. He was part of Dr. King's inner circle. He helped pull off the March on Washington in 1963, and he was gay. He, as, as you say, he was just a, a seminal figure in this movement because King depended on Bayard for so many things. He was King's first educator in nonviolence, and he just expanded King's knowledge of this hundredfold. You know, Bayard wrote the first article ever published under Dr. King's name. Hmm. I think it was, I'm not sure it was in the Nation magazine, but uh, an article sort of revisiting the Montgomery bus boycott and saying what it meant, and Bayard Rustin wrote that. To say he organized the March on Washington really doesn't give him enough credit. Mm -hmm. he, he put this thing together. Now, we're used to, you know, big protests in, in Washington nowadays. They happen, it seemed, almost every week or so. But this was almost a first, and it was certainly the first involving black people. And it was a first involving bringing people from all over the country here in Washington for this event. And Rustin just was such a superb organizer. Uh, he pulled it off and no problem. You are one of the few prominent members of the civil rights movement to come out full square in favor of gay marriage. It just seems to be something right to do. Uh, it seems to me that the right to be married is a civil right and I believe civil rights ought to be extended to everybody. Who, who ought not have these rights? What, what category of people ought not have these rights? I can't think of one. I've been married twice, and I know how, what the benefits are, the economic benefits are to a couple. And uh, I don't want to shut other people off from these benefits. Earlier this year, you opened the 20th Annual Creating Change Conference, um, sponsored by the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. And you said then, quote, like race, our sexuality is not a preference. It's, it is immutable, unchangeable, and the Constitution protects us all against prejudices and discrimination based on immutable differences. What do you say to those who flat out disagree with that assessment? Well, if they seem to be open to some kind of rational argument, <laughs> then I, I try to make a rational argument. Your sexuality is an immutable characteristic. It's something you're born with. You don't say, hey, I think I'll be gay. Uh, you are gay when you're born or you're not gay. So what is the connection between the civil rights movement and the gay civil rights movement as we know it today? At the bottom, it's these immutable characteristics. You are what you are, and you cannot be discriminated against in this country for what you are. That's, that's the similarity, that's the closeness, and, and the fact that the black civil rights movement came to public attention before the gay civil rights movement, which is existing at the same time, but I don't think well known to people. These draw from each other, and the gay movement draws tactics and techniques and, and songs and slogans, as did the uh, Hispanic movement, as did the women's movement. And it's not that these movements are taking from us. Uh, because the black movement took from other movements before us. We took from the labor movement. And I never heard of people from the labor movement complaining about this. Mm -hmm. And for black people to complain about this, we ought to be proud of this. Say, look what we did. We created a model that other people have followed. And they followed it successfully. Good for us. The widow of Dr. Martin Luther King, that was Coretta Scott King. Mm -hmm. Did you ever talk about this? No, I never did. I never talked to her about this, uh, just as I never talked to my colleagues in the movement <laughs> about these things. I never talked to her about it. Uh, but I, I quoted her as often as I could. And when she died, and it was announced that Ebenezer Baptist Church, where her uh, husband had been pastor, was too small for the funeral ceremony, and it was instead headed for a church run by a notorious homophobic minister in Atlanta, I decided not to go. What should gay people know about her that they might not already know? Well, first, I don't think many of them know that she was this strong advocate for uh, gay rights, for uh, all of the things that gay people want and need. Uh, I think her advocacy of these things is relatively unknown. And when I speak to audiences and quote her, I can see some of the people saying, really? 
you know, happily, but really? And so I think they could learn some more about her. She was in many ways a remarkable person. And to think of her as the, the wife and widow of Martin Luther King in some ways diminishes her because she was more than that. She was greater than that. She had a life of her own. She was an independent person. Uh, so of course she was the wife. Of course she was the mother. Of course she was the standard bearer after he died. But she was more than that. Mm -hmm. You have gone basically around the country um, campaigning against um, anti-gay marriage amendments uh, in, various, in, in various states. Do you, were you, I mean, did you voluntarily do this? Did people come to you and say, you know, we could really use your name and your stature behind this? Both those things happened. Um, the NAACP uh, is opposed to these amendments. We don't have a position on marriage equality. We're neutral on that or agnostic on that. Uh, but we do oppose these amendments because we think it's wrong to single out any group of people for special treatment. And that's what these amendments do. And so wherever they've ra raised their heads, we've campaigned against them. And where I've been able to physically go, uh, I've done it myself. Mm -hmm. Just before she died, Mildred Loving, who was the wife uh, of the couple of uh, the famous Supreme Court case, Loving versus Virginia, which ended the ban on interracial marriage. Just before she died, she came out in favor of marriage equality. To the gay community, what's the significance of that, do you think? Well, it ought to have significance not just to the gay community, but the African-American community and the American community. Here's this woman who, with her husband, fought to eliminate this barrier to interracial marriage, making it possible for me to get married in Virginia, because I married a, a white woman in Virginia, uh, and making it possible for others around the country who previously couldn't get married to get married now. She's an icon of the marriage movement. And now she can become an icon of the marriage equality movement. So uh, again, like Mrs. King, I don't think as many people know as should know about Mrs. King's attitudes. Uh, and I don't think as many people know as should know about Mildred Loving's attitudes. And I'd hope she'd be raised up and used as an example. Uh, here's this woman who fought for her own rights and now feels that she must also fight for others' rights. Here's the closing cosmic question. I am a 17, 18-year-old um, black kid anywhere in, in the United States, urban America, rural America, suburban America, exurban America, and I just don't get the connection that there is even a connection between the civil rights movement that you helped lead and the gay rights movement that I see all sorts of people uh, pushing and leading from people on television, to people in politics, um, people in business. Why, one, why should I care? And two, what is, the, what is the connection? Convince me. The connection is rights. Rights, that's the key word. These are movements for rights. And these are movements to ensure that uh, everyone has these rights. And this 17-year-old kid uh, may not think he's ever going to get married, or if he's straight, uh, is going to marry a woman. But uh, this guarantees his rights. And if he's not interested in his rights, then I wouldn't spend much time talking with him. Thanks, Mr. Bond. Thank you. Founding members of the Daughters of Belitis, Del Martin and Phyllis Lyons celebrated more than 50 years of love and activism on June 16, 2008, when they were married for a second time by San Francisco Mayor Gavin Newsom. We're gathered here today in the presence of all of you as witnesses for the purpose of uniting in matrimony Phyllis and Del. The contract of marriage is most solemn and is not to be entered into lightly, but thoughtfully. <laughs> Do you, Phyllis, take this woman, Dell, to be your lawful wedded spouse? I do. Do you promise to love her and to comfort her, to honor her, and to keep her in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer, for better or for worse? and to be faithful to her <laughs> as long as you both shall live. I do. And you, Del, yes. 
take this woman, Phyllis, yes. to be your lawful wedded spouse. Yes. And you promise to love her and to comfort her, to keep her in sickness and in health, for richer and for poorer, for better and for worse, and to be faithful to her as long as you both shall live. Yes. I give you this ring. I give you this ring. In token and pledge. In token and pledge. Of my constant faith. Of my constant faith. And abiding love. And abiding love. With this ring. With this ring. I be wed. I be wed. Now that you have joined yourselves in solemn matrimony, delight in each other's company, and never take the other for granted. For, for you've always been destined to enjoy this blessed and extraordinary day. It is my extraordinary honor to pronounce you spouses for life. Thank you for watching In The Life. To sign up for monthly air date alerts or to download episodes 24-7, please go to our website at inthelifetv.org or call 1-800-627-ON-TV. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Michael Billy. Thanks for tuning in, and please join us next month. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation, New Paul Foundation, Arcus Foundation, the estate of Richard W. Wyland, David Beitzel and Darren Walker, Agnes Gunn and Daniel Shapiro, and these funders, and by the annual support of In the Life members like you.